Okay, welcome everybody. We're about two minutes before we're going to get started. Um, but before we dig in, it's Colin from the Invasive Species Center here. Uh, just wanted to learn a little bit about you. If you've got a minute to uh, to fill out a poll here, I'm going to launch a poll and just want to know um, where you are hanging out today. So you should see a poll rise up and just want to know where you're joining us from today. So I'll leave that open for a few seconds here. We've got Ontario, Eastern Canada, Western Canada, Great Lakes states, and other. Leave it open for another 10 seconds. Okay, awesome. I'm going to go ahead and close the poll. Get your answers in now. Okay. All right. Welcome, everybody. So we've got a little bit over half from Ontario, some Eastern Canada, Western Canada representation. And uh, hello to our neighbors to the south from the Great Lakes states. Glad everybody could join us today. Um, looking good here. And just one more question, if you could indulge us. The question is, which of the following best describe your experience level with invasive aquatic plants? Are you as green as northern water milfoil? Are you slowly growing your knowledge like calcium limited mussels? Or are you ex as experienced as hydrilla is dense? Looking good. I'll leave it go. I'll leave it going for another five seconds here. All right. Thanks, everybody. So we've got a good mix coming in today. So that's great. That'll help us uh, make sure that we're we're speaking at the right level for today's uh, webinar on Water Soldier. So appreciate the feedback on that. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and log those results off. And I see we're one minute after 11 here. So I'm going to go ahead and get us started. We were up to 36 attendees. So I think a few more uh, have registered. So we'll let them trickle in as we go. Um, so with that said, uh, good morning, everybody. And, and welcome to the second installment of the Invasive Species Center's 2020 webinar series. Uh, my name is Colin Kasson, and I'm the Policy Analyst at the Invasive Species Centre, and I'm very pleased to be moderating today's webinar. So you may be aware that today's webinar falls on the International Day for Biological Diversity, which is an opportunity for everybody around the world, including uh, folks from the 196 countries that are parties to the Convention on Biological Diversity, to reflect a little bit on how our actions and work promote good stewardship of, of global biodiversity. Um, and if the topic of invasive species floats your boat in the same way that it does mine, then you're probably aware that the uh, the IC, IUCN, the International Union for Conservation of Nature, uh, cites invasive species as the second leading cause of species extinctions or species losses at a global scale. And at times I find it can be a little bit difficult for us to kind of put this in context, really big complex challenges into more digestible and local context. So. Um, I just wanted to note that today's webinar for me personally does such a good job. It's really the pinnacle example of how invasive species can really truly take over a system and inflict substantial shifts in the function um, of an otherwise healthy and diverse aquatic environment. So before we dig in on today's uh, water soldier webinar, which for my money, for whatever that's worth, is Ontario's worst aquatic invasive plant, uh, let's tackle a few quick housekeeping notes. So first, today's webinar is brought to you by the Invasive Species Center. Uh, we're a nonprofit organization that connects stakeholders, uh, knowledge, and technology to prevent introduction and spread of invasive species that harm Canada's environment, economy, and society. 
Uh, we've got a number of excellent invasive species resources on our website, um, such as our new spotted lanternfly fact sheet, which we find pretty valuable. Um, so please take a second and uh, check it out online at www.invasivespeciescenter.ca. Um, a couple quick plugs, if you don't mind. Uh, there you can click on the Get News button uh, under the Get Involved tab on the site to sign up for our new events and webinar invitations. You can also sign up there for our quarterly newsletter, The Spread, uh, which we highlight new resources, blog posts, invasive species updates. Uh, and there you can also sign up for our bi-weekly media research and event scan, where we curate for you some current invasive species news articles and research. Um, and then a newer feature on the site I'd love to plug is our event section where we list notable invasive species events and webinars that are happening across Canada. So speaking of webinars, we've got registration upcoming for um, our uh, other upcoming webinars in our 2020 uh, webinar series that are now live. Uh, please join us on the uh, June 25th at 1 p.m. Eastern. Our guest speaker, Eric Cleland from the Nature Conservancy of Canada, is going to speak about invasive Phragmites control program that's happening in Ontario's Long Point region. Uh, for those who might be unfamiliar with the program, the webinar is going to provide an excellent overview of Canada's largest Phragmites control effort and sure to be a hit. So it's a very popular topic. Uh, one more to plug, we've got um, another one that I'd like to announce today. So we have a webinar on July 7th from 1 till 2.30 p.m. with a newer species to Canada. Um, we're going to do a deep dive in spotted lanternfly, which is an invasive insect not presently known to be found in Ontario, um, but has caused substantial damage to agricultural and natural resource interests south of the border. So this webinar is going to fe um, feature Heather Leach and Julie Urban, both from Penn State Extension, as well as her own uh, Mandy Imes, who's going to cover some spotted lanternfly impacts, research, and some perspectives from Ontario as well. So as I say, both uh, webinar registrations are now live as of this morning at our website, invasivespeciescenter.ca. Uh, lastly, I wanted to mention that our April 2020 webinar featuring Ducks Unlimited Canada's Kyle Borelman is now available as well to see on the ISC YouTube page along with other past webinars. Uh, this is a really great, well-attended webinar. It featured uh, kind of all you need to know on European water chestnut management efforts in Ontario, and it's a great complement to the content and uh, content that we're going to be discussing today. Um, so with that in mind, a few technical notes. Um, there's going to be questions for today's, uh, for questions at, at the end of today's webinar. So if you have questions at any time, please feel free to throw them in the, the question box over on the right-hand side. And I'm going to go ahead and read those and moderate those at the end of the session. Uh, if you have any technical difficulties at any time, uh, please go ahead and type them into the chat box as well. We'll be happy to do our best to have some ISC staff uh, support and resolve that. And lastly, you're going to receive a very brief survey after the webinar. Um, if you could take a second to fill it out, we certainly would appreciate we, we do use those results to kind of modify future approaches and make sure that we're just uh, checking every box for you guys and every uh, future webinar attendee. So with that said and out of the way, uh, let's move on to today's main event. So today's webinar is titled Water Soldier Eradication Efforts in Ontario. Uh, and it's really my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker today, Robert McGowan. Uh, Rob's with the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters Invading Species Awareness Program. Uh, Rob's a graduate of Fleming College and Trent University, and he's worked for Ontario's Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry, Fleming College, and Trent University for about the past 15 years. Uh, currently, Rob's the management technician at the Invading Species Awareness Program, where for the past seven years, Rob's been the lead on provincial monitoring efforts, uh, surveillance, control around water soldier populations in the Trent Severn Waterway, and in a bunch of private ponds across Ontario. So with that said, um, Rob, thank you very much for joining us today. Give me a second here, I'm gonna flip over to your slides and I will let you drive the bus from here on out. Take it All away, right. Rob. Thank you, Colin. Uh, hey everybody, how are you? Um, just gonna go through uh, some efforts that have been uh, put forth since 2008 when Water Soldier was first found in, uh, in Ontario. Uh, what we've done, uh, some of the, the problems we've had and how we've overcome them, and uh, where we're going in the future. Uh, so from Collins Poll, I saw that there's there's a lot of beginners, so we're going to start right at the beginning of the basics of what Water Soldier is, and move right down into, sorry, um, uh, the monitoring control, uh, our, our efforts towards private ponds, and lessons that we've learned through this, this uh, past 10 years. So let's get right into the sauce. So what is it? Uh, water soldier is an invasive perennial aquatic plant that is native to Europe and Northwest Asia. 
The first known wild population in North America was found in the Trent River in 2008, near Hamlet of Trent River. Water, water soldier was used as an ornamental plant in water gardens, which is a likely source of its introduction to the Trent River. So wh why is it a problem? A water soldier forms dense mats of floating and submerged vegetation. It crowds out native vegetation, resulting in decreased biodiversity. Uh, water soldier has the potential to alter surrounding water chemistry, which may harm phytoplankton and other aquatic organisms. The dense floating mats of water soldier can hinder recreational activities such as boating, angling, and swimming. Sharp serrated leaf edges can cut swimmers and individuals who handle the plant. Uh, as you can see on this picture on the, the right hand side here, <clears throat> you can see those sharp uh, serrated uh, margin right there uh, and they'll cut you. Um, <clears throat> so when you're handling the plant, you should be, should be aware of that. Okay, so where's, where, where would you find water soldier? So uh, <clears throat> uh, the typical habitat water soldier is slow or slow flowing mesotrophic water. It's not found in really shallow water or fast flowing water or in areas where wa water fluctuates due to the sinking and floating behavior of the plant. The plant is, likes to be lightly rooted and prefers soft muddy sediments. Um, under conditions of low light, the leaves do not develop enough gas in their air canals and intercellular spaces to become emergent. And it is normal to find water soldiers at bottom dwelling plant in between one to five meters deep with low light conditions. So what does it look like? So water soldier appears as two different forms, a submergent, which the picture in the middle is a submergent, and emergent, the picture on the left. <clears throat> the submerged form overgrows the bottom of the littoral zone and has long, bright green, brittly, spirally twisted mature leaves that have a serrated margin of sharp spines. The emergent form breaches the water surface and has stiff erect leaves with serrated spines on the margin. Both forms of water soldier produce turions and offsets. In the late spring, rosettes from the roots that grow into the sediment, loosely anchoring the plant, and at the same time, offsets start to form. Uh, flowering in emergent plants occur midsummer in Ontario. Uh, in 2014, when they were first uh, found flowering. There was a sample of 50 flowers sent to the National Herbarium in Ottawa and uh, they proved that they, they couldn't find any viable seed and this is pretty consistent in most of the water soldiers native range. So the rosette leaves can grow up to 60 centimeters. You can see the picture with me holding those uh, two water soldier plants upside down. Well exceeded 60 centimeters. Um, so uh, I'd say 60 centimeters might be an average. Um, uh, bright green, you can see how bright green it is in color. The leaves are sword shaped, rigid, brittle, and have serrated margin and sharp spines. The flowers are white with three petals, and they like to lightly root in soft sediments. And that being said, they lightly root, they could be very mobile um, if any wave action or boat wakes hit, hit the populations. <clears throat> so, seasonal changes in temperature. Uh, can result in the ecological and morphological changes to the water soldier plants. Water soldier becomes submergent in water in the fall and overwinters in a rootless state. So you see the picture in the top left, how all those outer leaves are brown and dying. So <clears throat> uh, this is what helps the plant sink in the, in the fall and the outer leaves lose their photosynthetic gas and become, uh, which helps it to become buoyant in the summer. And in the fall, these leaves lose their gas and become waterlogged, and it helps the plant to sink. In the winter, the leaves with the stem perform a storage function, uh, keeping starch in their cells, and this is what helps them to survive the winter under the ice. In the spring, as a rootless rosette rises towards the water surface, it forms new additional roots, and the offset, offsets become active, and the vegetative reproduction begins again. So reproduction. <clears throat> water soldier uh, relies primarily on vegetative reproduction through offset centurions. And you can see um, some of these pictures here, are the, the left uh, canning, Bob Canning's picture there, he has a uh, offset with some turions in his hand. 
and you can see in the top right corner that's my daughter holding um, a water soldier plant with the uh, rosette exposed where you can see an offset forming and a tur turion forming there. <clears throat> so the offsets develop directly into open rosettes resembling small versions of the parent plant and become detached by late summer. Offsets that develop late in the growing season are almost bud-like and are called turions. These turions will remain on the mother plant until the following spring when they detach. So you can see the uh, picture in the bottom right corner. That's a very large water soldier plant. And the circled offset, um, you know, we're talking this is mid to late summer. That's, that's almost a fully grown plant on there. So these offsets can get very large as well. And it, it would, all, would almost have been growing turions itself. And if that dis, uh, uh, detaches from the mother plant, and it can just establish its own uh, colony and population very readily. Um, <clears throat> so as I said earlier, like sexual reproduction is very rare, even in the water soldier's native range. And uh, water soldier's main means of reproduction in the Trent Severn Waterway and, and Ontario uh, are the, is the way of offsets. And it's been very successful in uh, that reproductive strategy here. So kind of given a bit about what water soldier is, why is a problem, what does it look like? So now let's talk about water soldier in Ontario. <clears throat> so water soldier was first reported in Tread Severn Waterway, which is a, it's a waterway that's 387 kilometers long that attaches Georgian Bay to the Bay of Quinty. Um, and as you can see here, this green circle, we're dealing with the lower portion of the uh, river, which is about 50 to 60 kilometers from Highway 30 in Trent, uh, Trent Hills, um, down to uh, right now we're about at Glen Ross, 20 kilometers up from the Bay of Quinty. Um, so Water Soldier was first reported in the Trent Severn Waterway in September 2008, and this was the first report in the wild in North America. Water Soldier has since traveled downstream 50 kilometers and is presently found below Lock 7, about 20 kilometers up from Bay Quinty. Um, the second report in the wild was uh, on the Black River in Sutton, Ontario, which is a tributary to Lake Simcoe. Um, due to rapid response efforts by the Aurora District MNRF, um, they were successful in uh, eradicating it. Um, there hasn't been any water soldier found in the Black River since 2016, and monitoring continues each year. So what, what, what I have here is um, a timeline series of pictures that a uh, landowner has um, documented over the past 10, or sorry, uh, well, maybe seven years. Um, she had water soldiers, she was concerned about it, and so she started taking pictures every year. So we can see in this picture, we have some water soldier in the forefront, and we have some water soldier against the shoreline there. And this is in the summer of 2013, where there hasn't been any uh, large-scale control effort yet. So you can see in summer 2014, this, these are the dense mats that we start talking about and why water soldier becomes a problem and uh, really interferes with uh, the, the natural system and uh, how we use the waterway. So you can see right here, it's filled in and you can see these dense populations starting to accumulate uh, in the background there as well. So let's fast forward to the spring of 2015. So the landowner had to change her perspective. She's no longer taking this picture down the shoreline. She's had to move her perspective to look because now these dense mats have gone and it's beyond her dock now. So you can see how this is really, uh, really becoming an issue in a very short period of time. And we'll take a look at August, 2015. So now, I, I don't know what this poor guy is trying to do in that boat, but he's not going far. Um, <clears throat> there's a dense mat of water soldier that has taken over the whole bay in the matter of two years. And uh, I'm gonna leave you on this picture because I have more pictures to come on the same timeline series. <clears throat> what we'll do now is we'll get into uh, the initial response to water soldier. So when water soldier was first discovered, there was no clear ag agency response for addressing aquatic invasive species in Ontario. Um, there was legislative gaps to address import, sale, possession, and transport of aquatic invasive species, such as water soldier. Um, and we really had no 
no guidance because there had no history of management in North America or Europe, and there was very limited information on control. And the control options we did have were primarily hand pulling, and then there was uh, an extension, emergency extension to the reward label to have water soldier listed under it temporarily, so we could try to see uh, if it was effective on uh, water soldier. So to address the serious threat that water soldier posed, uh, interagency working group was formed in 2013 to help coordinate research, monitoring, control, and prevention strategies. An integrated management plan was drafted to help prevent new introductions of water soldier to the province and to eradicate existing populations that threaten to invade provincial, national, and international waters. So what's the timeline on that? So in 2008, September 2008, the time we really got on it was already 2009. Uh, there wasn't very much time uh, to start managing it. So detection and rapid response. So there were some initial herbicide treatments under the emergency label extension for reward and manual removals. Um, there really wasn't um, <clears throat> uh, uh, any systematic monitoring in place for this. So um, <clears throat> it was more of a uh, just go out, find it, and rip it out of the water as fast as you can, uh, where now we have a uh, integrated management plan that helps guide us uh, in our in our management and control efforts. Um, so in 2012, uh, the Ontario Invasive Species Strategic Plan provided the basis for the provincial response to address water soldier, including prevention, detection, control, and eradication actions, which was really important. It was really important to give the provincial government that 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 lead where the, we're in charge of this, we're going to move forward and we're going to help manage this, uh, eradicate this invasive species. Um, in 2013, Water Soldier was identified by the Council of Great Lake Governors and Premiers of Ontario and Quebec as a priority for prevention and response. It was listed on the least wanted aquatic species list for the Great Lakes Basin. Um, in 2014, the, the development of the Water Soldier Integrated Management Plan happened. And in 2016, which this is a very huge piece of uh, policy, was the Invasive Species Act came into force. And this act provides Ontario with the power to classify invasive species as prohibited or restricted. Prohibitions include import, possession, transport, propagation, buying, selling, trading, etc. And water soldier was among the first species to be regulated as a prohibited species under this act. And this is so important because uh, with all the effort that we were going through to manage this, uh, there was there was no policy in, in place to say, hey, well, you can't have that plant, you can't transport that plant, you can't move this plant around. And since this act has come in, we have had calls where people had this in their private ponds, and and you know they didn't know know it was illegal, and uh, but it gives us an opportunity to help educate people on uh, not not having this plant, sharing this plant, or possessing this plant. So we have background on. <clears throat> a timeline where when it came uh how we managed it a bit uh how we got our ducks in a row so now let's move forward and uh get into uh how how we find this plan how we monitor for this plan in order to to take a look at our, how we're going to eradicate it and control it so uh for the monitoring uh the monitoring on the trend Severn waterway specifically we utilize a point intercept design to sample the study area with a grid scale that is 50 meters by 50 meters, and all the line intercepts have unique identifiers. So you can see down here, here's the grid, and all those are labeled with a unique identifier. And then we've broken up the lake into sections just to make it more manageable. Um, each crew is equipped with a tablet and real-time GPS that shows the survey grid lines and the crew's real-time position in the sampling area. Uh, the, we travel by the boat, along these grid lines, recording a value of zero to three for a water soldier value at each 50 meter grid intercept. So zero would be no water soldier, one would be a single plant, two would be scattered plants, and three would be a dense colony uh, of the water soldier plants. So the boat driver trolls along a survey line, calling out each 50 meter intercept. If the observers are able to see the river or lake bottom, they may include any water soldier plant that they observe between the survey points, and record the value at the intercept point. If the river or lake bottom is not visible due to depth or turbidity, 
the boat driver will remain over the survey point and the observers will use a double-sided rake on a telescopic pole to collect a sample of the submerged aquatic plants that may be present and record the top three aquatic species found. So here we have uh, the Trent Severn Waterway. This section we refer to as Lake Seymour. And these are the results for the monitoring in 2017. Um, <clears throat> and this is what the da data looks like um, when it's tied to the water soldier values collected in the monitoring and transferred into visual information. So as you can see here at the bottom left, water soldier values. So this is our water soldier 0, 1, 2, 3 transferred into a color ramp. <clears throat> so you can see that there's a uh, the red is very dense colonies, orange is uh, scattered plants and yellow single plants. So if we fast forward to 2018, you can see this information isn't only helpful for directing our control efforts each year, but because survey grid and protocols are consistent, we can track our effect effectiveness and evaluate the success of treatments year by year. So surveillance is another way we do monitoring. Uh, the working group felt it was necessary to perform reconnaissance downstream and upstream of the known populations to see if the water soldier has spread further. Uh, surveillance performed by the OFAH has found that water soldier uh, has been found further downstream of known populations each year since 2014, which makes sense. It's a, it's a flowing river. So um, <clears throat> when you have a floating plant in a flowing river, uh, you can expect to find it downstream. <clears throat> Water Soldier Watch Day is another way we carry out monitoring activities. Uh, each year we co coordinate a volunteer day to engage the public to come out and help us search for Water Soldier outside its known distribution. And we also hold two open houses to communicate the results of the yearly monitoring to the public and inform them of planned management efforts for the season. <clears throat> uh, another helpful tool to monitor is uh, EdMaps and the Advanced Species Awareness Hotline. Um, <clears throat> EdMaps is a free citizen science tool where members of the public can submit sightings of invasive species. All the reports are viewed in-house by experts and can be viewed in real time. EdMaps is an important tool to track leading edge of invasive species and can aid in early detection and rapid response efforts. And also with the Invasive Species Hotline, the same thing. If you call us and you can make reports of invasive species and we track those. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, uh, the integrated management plan relies extensively on the Trent risk assessment and on research conducted at Trent University on water soldier physiology and reproduction. The integrated management plan also incorporates evaluations of management outcomes from various control methods and strategies applied since 2009. Uh, the IMP is intended to provide guidance for surveillance, control, and management activities and information on outreach programs all leading to the eradication of water soldier from Ontario. And the IMP, <clears throat> it's not, it's changed since 2014. It's, a, it's meant to be a living document and we will be updating it as circumstances and understanding of our management directions uh, change and how the plant evolves over time. So the objectives of the integrated management plan are to uh, prevent the introduction and spread of water soldier to new locations in Ontario. Implement early detection and rapid response actions to locate and eradicate new water soldier populations in Ontario. Eradicate established water soldier populations from public waters in Ontario. And work with the private sector to identify and eradicate water soldier from private waters in Ontario. <clears throat> okay, so moving on with some of the critical information in the integrated management plan or control options. Um, so since the IMP has been implemented, we have been um, testing the efficacy of all of, or trying to test the efficacy of all of these control, uh, control options that are outlined in the integrated management plan. And I'll just go through a few of them now. <clears throat> so manual removal. So manual removal is a good option for small isolated populations of water soldier. Although it's time consume, consuming due to the habitat where the where water soldier likes to live, the soft muddy sediments make the water column very turbid 
And losing sight of these plants is very easy when you're removing them. Um, <clears throat> another downfall is when you're removing these plants manually, uh, they like to float. So as you're pulling them up, some may fall off your rake and they can just suspend in the water column. So if they're suspending in the water column and the water column is turbid, you're gonna lose sight of these. Um, typically when I'm managing water soldier, uh, the, pop the, the population has to be the right size to do manual removal. Uh, I like to surround populations with a seine net or something that I can enclose a population in. And, and this prevents any plants from escaping. Um, it's a little tedious to do this, uh, the way you have to maneuver your boat around, the way you have to pull the, uh, the plants out with a rake, um, and the, the time it takes. Because once you start pulling, the water becomes turbid, you can't see. Usually, I work on a, one population for 20, 30 minutes. I leave, let the, wa the, the water settle back down and all the sed sediments settle back down and then come back and manage again. So um, <clears throat> it, is, it is time consuming. And uh, I find when you find a water soldier population that there's a lot more plants there than you think. Um, so uh, I know a lot of people who manage themselves dive right in and uh, it's exhausting because what you think uh, looks like 50 plants turns out to be two, two to 300 plants because they build up on each other. So that's one consideration to take into, uh, that's one thing to consider when thinking about managing water soldier populations. So mechanical harvester. So in 2015, the OFH secured from, fr funds from the MECP to test the efficacy of mechanical harvesting on water soldier. This method removed 90 tons, or sorry, 90 cubic yards of water soldier in seven days. And that, to put this into perspective, uh, nine, 90 cubic yards um, came from about one surface acre of water. Um, so not really, in, in seven days, that's not very productive. Um, this method was costly and uh, it helped to spread the water soldier um, it's not an easy, it's not, it's not a, it's a pretty messy method. Um, and I would recommend if you're going to use a mechanical har harvester for any um, uh, control of aquatic species, you get booms and have booms in place. Um, be, we were supposed to have booms and uh, they didn't come and it would have, it would have helped preventing the spread of the, of the water soldier during these um, uh, efforts. Uh, another thing is that the mechanical harvester, why it took so long is it's it's a pretty it's pretty sluggish and slow. So from where we want we had our our removal site to, to the shore where we had our disposal bin, um, it was very time consuming when the hopper filled, the mechanical harvest coming back, unloading, and then going back out to the the site. So um, site selection um, is something that may have, uh, been uh, be had better consideration. Shade cloth enclosures. So Trent University and the OFH installed shade cloth enclosures on three populations of water soldier in June 2016. The enclosures were left for two months and when removed, 99% of the water soldier was dead. Uh, this is a great treatment to apply to small isolated populations of water soldier. The size of the population is important for the success of the treatment, making these structures too large result in failure and hazards for boats and recreational activities and could cause damage to watercraft and people. Um, these particular um, <clears throat> shade cloth enclosures we fashioned with uh, landscape fabric and rebar. I'm sure that there's other um, uh, methods out there. I know people have bottom barriers and whatnot, uh, but this worked really well. Um, what we really considered is finding populations off the beaten path uh, in back bays where people wouldn't be boating, they wouldn't be recreating. Um, and we had to take into consideration uh, the size of the structure because of, uh, of, of waves, wind, uh, boat wakes. Um, what we did it really worked well and uh, I was pleased with it. Herbicide applications. The working group has determined that herbicide treatments are the most cost-effective and successful treatment 
to address water soldier. We have tried control methods and have seen the amazing success with the use of Diquat, um, and it it just just worked. We really had some great success with it. So we're going to revisit the picture from August 2015. This guy's still trying to get the boat out. So um, <clears throat> there was a large scale herbicide treatment in the fall of 2015. And this is July 2016. So you can see there's still water soldier. We have it along uh, the dock here behind the boat. There might be a little bit of out, out there offshore. Um, but then here's July 2017 after another herbicide treatment in 2016. Uh, night and day. Um, you can actually drive a boat up to their dock now and they can get back to the normal use of their recreational space. And July 2018. Um, we didn't treat in 2018 because our monitoring didn't have, uh, we didn't have any water soldier there. So this is how successful the herbicide treatments have been, and we're pretty we're pretty happy with the results. Okay, moving from the Trent Severn Waterway into the private ponds, because the IMP, the Integrated Management Plan, uh, outlines that for uh, the private ponds in Ontario that contain water soldier represent a source of possible contamination to other water bodies, and these populations should be addressed. So the OFH had received funding from the MNRF to, in 2017 and 2018 to address these ponds and to work uh, to eradicate uh, to work with the landowners to eradicate water soldier from their ponds. So as we can see here, we have 14 ponds across Ontario. Um, <clears throat> three new reports in 2019. They are yellow uh, with a star. And we all, management has been uh, per performed on all of them. Uh, before that, 2018, we were sitting at a 54% eradication rate. Um, I was super happy about that. And then those three popped up, and now we're at a 42%. Um, but hopefully next year, when we go, uh, or this this year, sorry, when we go and uh, do our follow up, we'll see that there is no water soldier there. Um, and the uh, uh, populations in blue are ongoing efforts. Um, most of these people didn't realize that water soldier was uh, uh, listed under the Invasive Species Act, and uh, we worked together with them to help them get rid of water soldier. So in 2017, we treated three ponds. In 2018, we treated 10 ponds. In 2019, we treated another three ponds. A total of 14 ponds were known. All have been treated except for one because we did not have access to it. So you can see here, this is one of the ponds uh, that's close to Peterborough. And uh, after two, this, this is one of the ponds that were, was treated twice. After two treatments, there's been no water soldier since 2019. So hopefully it stays that way. Okay, so lessons learned. Um, it's been... I've been working on this project for seven years. There's been people who've been working on it for a long time, and uh, government leadership is necessary to coordinate the large-scale control efforts with support from uh, agency partners. I can't stress how much uh, our interagency working group. Uh, everybody works so hard and collaboratively together, and this is why it's so successful. Um, public engagement, a strong uh, public support for the use of herbicide over water as the most effective con control tool has been imperative. Um, we've had people that they have regained their their waterfront. Um, and ongoing communications and outreach are important, which we do through our volunteer days and whatnot. <clears throat> uh, research uh, support is critical. Understanding how this plant's changing um, and how the populations are changing, we're going to have to uh, change with it. So. Um, uh, as we go to smaller, more isolated populations, we'll probably be moving more away from uh, herbicide, possibly, into those other uh, control efforts that we piloted. <clears throat> and access to effective herbicide tools is important. Um, Diquat is the only registered product available for overwater use in Canada for control of aquatic vegetation. 
And it's fortunate that reward was effective on water soldier, but it may not be effective on other aquatic species that threaten Ontario. Um, access to additional herbicides would help to diversify our approach and to control water soldier and uh, possible new aquatic species that come to Ontario. Uh, the response will continue. Uh, the interagency working group will continue to work together to address water soldier. Uh, management approaches, we will have to adapt according to the circumstances and the understanding of the plant evolves over time. And we're excited and hopeful to build off the recent success that we've seen in parts of the infestations. And that's it. Is there any questions? Rob, that's great. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Um, we've, we've got a few questions coming in here um, into okay. the question box. So just as a, a quick reminder to everybody tuning in, um, if you can throw your questions into that um, question box uh, through GoToWebinar, that'd be appreciated. I've got a few that Rob will start to float out to you. Um, one question here just coming in about biological control. You, you kind of showed a few different management options. Anything on that that you can update the group on? Uh, there, there are no biological controls. Um, I just, <laughs> I need to fill the space, and I know that um, biological control is listed under the integrated management plan, uh, but there are no known biological controls for water soldier right now. Okay, perfect. Um, someone else here is asking about um, access to the product either to the horticultural market, maybe its presence in private gardens or, or through um, less formal means. Um, anything? you can speak to on that. Uh, could you repeat that question, Colin? Sure, sorry. Um, so just somebody's asking about the access to the to water soldier, either through the horticultural market, uh, is it still actively bought and sold? Um, and, and kind of, I guess the part B is, is it still used in private gardens? Is that widespread its use? Well, I think that we're playing a bit of catch up. I think since um, 2016, when the Invasive Species Act came into place, that it was being sold at some uh, garden centers and whatnot, and how long had it been sold there? I think that's one question, um, because you saw how how it was a how how much area it covered across the landscape in those private ponds. We're talking from uh, Rondo all the way to Trent Hills. Um, that's probably six, seven, eight hundred kilometers straight line. So I think that. If it is still, you see it in um, a horticultural or um, ag store for sale, you should call the Invading Species Awareness Hotline. Um, or if you see it, you should educate people that it is illegal to possess, trade, transport. Um, and I think that we're going to see a lot more private ponds come up with water soldier in it, personally. Okay, good to know. So, um, so just to be clear, then, so since 2015, we've had provincial regulations prohibiting the sale uh, of water soldier, but we're still kind of um, dealing with some of the legacy, I guess, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Um, another question about the private ponds. Um, you know, is there any anecdotal information? How are they identified? How are they located? What's? I know they're probably all very different stories, but could you give us a feel for how they kind of came onto your radar? Uh, yeah, most most people would call when it became too big of a problem for them to handle. They would call the Invading Species Awareness Program hotline. Um, some other ones, we had reports um, come in because people uh, were speaking to neighbors and then they, their neighbors knew, like, whoa, you can't, you can't really have that or that's, that's an invasive species, you have to be careful with that. Uh, but primarily, once uh, people figure out or are exhausted and tired of trying to manage it themselves, they reach out for help. Okay, perfect. Um, I, I guess it becomes a pretty um, obvious issue over time, right? Um, when your when your pawn looks looks like your lawn. <laughs> <laughs> All right, perfect. Um, so we've got a question here about the use of eDNA for a monitoring tool. Um, anything you can you can tell the group about that? Uh, I know that it has been done. Um, uh, out of Trent University, there was some, some work done doing eDNA uh, work. Um, right now, doing eDNA, eDNA, eDNA work uh, 
in the Trent River, I find a little redundant because it's a flowing system. Water soldier has been present since 2008. I think you'd get hits on that all the time, but as a tool for uh, detecting water soldier where we don't know where it is, I think it could be effective. Okay, great. And another question on the monitoring bit. Um, is anyone using uh, drones to monitor or can you kind of think through any any pros or cons related to this particular species? Yeah, there has been some. Trent University, uh, Eric Sager, he was doing some work with drones and identifying, um, I, I'm not an expert on uh, this stuff, so take this um, with a grain of salt, um, using uh, light signature, color signatures to identify uh, water soldier with drones. Um, I'm not really sure where it's at. We're Everybody's kind of on lockdown right now, so usually uh, Eric has a uh, update in our spring meeting to let us know where where that's at. But it, it has been explored and we have used drone work um, for uh, some other, like not the actual monitoring, but actually how are we going to get to use the drones to do the actual monitoring? So some some research. Okay, great. And I guess with the different um, growth forms throughout the season too, that might kind of add a little bit of a layer of complexity to it as well. I think when it's uh, in, in its emergent form, it, it's pretty easy to pick out. It's those submergent populations. And what you what you got to understand is um, when we're monitoring, we'll come up to a patch of uh, lily pads and underneath the lily pads, it'll be all water soldiers. So there are some some challenges with the drone, I think, uh, being up in the air versus uh, boots on the ground, so to speak. Okay, great point. Um, so someone here is asking about disposal, the, the big million dollar question on most invasive plant control. Um, could you tell us a little bit about what you've done or, or maybe with the harvester being the best example, um, how do you deal with all that biomass? So yeah, the harvester was a, a pretty, unique situation i stumbled across uh, a local um guy that had a biodigester which is a uh I, i'm not really sure how it works but it takes organic materials and turns it into hydro so i that i just took i carted it all to him and he took it for free um but typically uh disposing of any aquatic invasive plant should be done uh carefully and minimal transport but make sure that you're 30 meters away from any other water body and let it dry out <clears throat> i think that's the safest way to know that you're not going to be a vector of spread and that those plants aren't going to re-enter another water body and become a problem somewhere else okay that's a great point rob um, so we've got a couple questions coming in about the product that's being used and maybe some of the non-target impacts. I, I know it's kind of not your area of work primarily, but yeah. um, so it's it's, it's Dyquat, right? Uh, reward. Dyquat yep. And is there anything you can share, Rob, on kind of non-target impacts or anything? Um, I know you're very familiar with the label. Is, is there anything you can share on that note? Uh, well, it, yeah. I, I usually don't speak towards herbicide because it's not my wheelhouse. Um, it it it's her uh, it's a contact herbicide and it doesn't uh anything it touches it it's going to affect um we haven't really seen a huge shift or i haven't really investigated if there's been a huge shift in non-target populations on the trend seven waterway um i'm really not a researcher um but being logical i'd, I'd say that it, it could have it would affect other species um for sure i just i'm not i don't really think i'm i'm qualified to uh, discuss herbicide i can put you sure. in contact with people that will be able to answer your questions though that'd be great rob i'll uh, i'll throw your contact info up on the next slide if that's okay and, and yeah, maybe perfect. if there's anyone who wants to follow up with you i'll let you know i can di direct any of those questions to uh to scott olin from the mecp perfect. Um, okay, so uh, just a question here coming in about the Black River population from 2016. Is is there anything, I know that wasn't a project that, that maybe you were leading, but is there any kind of best practices or lessons learned that 
that jump out to you um, based on that experience? It was such a successful rapid response. The, the rapid response is what made that so successful. Um, you know, uh, Will Wegman and Mel Shapiro from uh, the MNR Aurora District uh, hopped on that, um, OFH uh, and even MNRF Peterborough uh, assisted them and you know they had a they had a bit of an advantage with uh dealing with the plant after uh peterborough district and the working group had dealt with the plant for so long that they had a bit of support and they had those kind of answers to questions that were were now obvious right so we need to get on it we need to contain it and we need to deal with it and uh it was well i i think you were even out a few days there colin um, on the Black River. Yeah, it was. It, it, the thing that impressed me most about, most about that, Rob, was it was really like multi-layered um, IPM, right? So the, they were using right. silt curtains just to kind of contain it. They were using hand pulling just to try and remove as much biomass as possible and ultimately following up with the chemical um, control. So just, uh, you know, th those were kind of my key takeaways for why what was so interesting about it when they actually kind of got boots on the ground and started doing the control effort. And I, I think everybody coming together and working collaboratively, collaboratively really kind of helps uh, situations like that. Yeah, it's a great point. Um, okay, so uh, last, question. <laughs> last question. So this question came in last month uh, when we had Kyle Borman on. So uh, I think it's only fair maybe to, to pitch it to you too. Um, so Rob, welcome to a pond in beautiful southwestern Ontario. And uh, Take you back five years ago, and someone unfortunately introduced water soldier, Eurasian water milfoil, and European water chestnut into the pond. Um, skip forward five years into the present date. Um, what do you think that community looks like now? Who, who is the invasive plant winner? Water soldier, no doubt. Why do you think so? Uh, I think it's uh, when it becomes emergent, it's going to come up. And it's going to blanket out a lot of the, the the light available to the other plants, and I think it it gets a hop on. If it gets a hop on the European water chestnut, uh, we're winning for sure. I'm not even worried about the milfoil. It's got that competitive advantage built in, right? It's right. You know, some of those pictures really speak to the idea that this is kind of a, a transitional species between aquatic plants and almost almost terrestrial. Yeah, and some, um, some of the na native species do really well, like the, the water lilies. Um, they put up a good fight. Uh, and, you know, we're, they actually come out of the water to still try to photosynthesize uh, above the, the, the water soldier. So um, they're, they're fighting. <laughs> they're competing out there. That's a heck of a competitor, so good for them. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, Rob, the last question I see coming in here is, um, can you give a bit more information on the types of habitat on the, uh, the um, Trans Southern Waterway that are proven the most difficult for water soldier eradication, um, I guess, primarily via chemical control? Like, I know it's quite stumpy, some of those back bays here in, right? Could you describe it a little more? Uh, uh, the, I'd say the most difficult areas to control water soldiers where there would be closer to the channel where the most flow is. Um, the residency, res, residency time for the herbicide would be less, and it, you may not be hitting your target properly. Um, you know, in those back bays, it's the water's not moving very much. It's pretty still. Um, there's a lot of obstacles, but the people who that we typically hired to treat these have airboats, so it's not, they're not really, uh, bound by props and motors uh, in the water getting hung up. They're just scooting right across all those kind of hazards. Um, so the populations that would be closest to the fastest flowing water that it would be able to live in, I think, would be an issue. A, with the boat traffic and the boat wakes being able to uh, dislodge plants and send them downstream, and B, uh, having the herbicide not have enough contact time with the plants to do their job properly. That's a great point. Well, it's a perfect segue out of this because um, 
Uh, Rob, I've got to compliment you. I know this is not the easiest setting to work in and kind of a, a, an eradication situation, right? It's, it's kind of a yeah. unique, interesting element, be it whether, whether it's water flow or kind of the back bay nature of it. or And it's a, it's a pretty major navigation waterway, too. It's, it's not the kind of more ideal landlocked pond. So um, right. it's, it's great to hear what you're talking about today. Really appreciate all the, all the effort you and your team and, and, and the broader group have put in on this. And thanks so much for bringing it to our attention today. No, um, so thanks again. Um, Thank you, Colin. Okay, perfect. So uh, with that said and that in mind, um, just a, a quick outro note. Uh, one quick plug um, for our next upcoming webinar is a set off the top. It's going to be June 25th, uh, featuring Nature Conservancy of Canada's Eric Cleland talking about a landscape level frag control, a really interesting project, kind of uh, not dissimilar scale to the one that we talked about today with water soldiers. So I'm sure that'll be of interest to the group. Um, so thanks so much, everybody, for tuning in today. Uh, stay safe, keep well, and we'll look forward to talking to you next time. Bye-bye now.